Hi, everyone. It's uh, your friends, Rabbi Susan Nannis and Tom Teichholz, back for another episode or webisode of Culture Mavens. Hi, Tom. Hey, Susan. Did you have a good week? Um, yeah, pretty good. Uh, I can't even remember. I do so many different things in one week that uh, it's hard to remember. Did you I did watch the Oscars? Movie. I did not watch the Oscars. How did come? You? Why didn't I? Yeah. To be honest, I I have Zoom fatigue. I have screen fatigue. I just couldn't watch it. Um, and I knew that it wouldn't be, they wouldn't have any. And I read any of those great production numbers, which is sort of my favorite part of the show, or any clips. Apparently, they didn't show clips from the movie. Well, so Apparently, you were not alone because viewership was down 58% over last year, and um, I will say that although the stage set at Union Station, uh, which was done by David Rockwell, who's a theater designer, was gorgeous, it, it was a Oscars devoid of any humor. Someone would be introducing the honorees or accepting the award. You could go out, have, a have dinner, and come back and the same person would still be talking. You know, there were many good things that happened right. in terms of the diversity of the people who won. But as a show, it was far from entertaining. So you 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 voted the way most of the country voted uh, with regard to watching the Oscars. Yeah, it just didn't seem interesting to me. So actually, what seems more interesting is this big controversy about the uh, biography of Philip Roth, which you had talked about last time. Correct. So tell us what's going on, the scandal. So in a twist, if it were in a Philip Roth novel, would be uh, the sort of metafiction twist that you could barely believe. Roth's chosen biographer and approved authorized biographer, Blake Bailey, the biographer of Richard Yates and John Cheever got phenomenal reviews for this book, uh, probably better reviews than I uh, might have given him. And, and he was on all these, you know, prestigious talk shows and was getting all this attention, uh, whereupon um, a number of women suddenly came forward to say that when he, several years ago, when he was an English teacher at a private school in New Orleans, he groomed and had inappropriate relationships with his students. And two other women said that on separate occasions, he raped them. And the publisher of the biography immediately halted publication. They had printed uh, 50,000 copies for a first printing, which is a big number for a publisher. And they were about to go back to press for more, and they stopped doing so. And um, as of today, uh, they announced that they are essentially canceling uh, the biography. If you read The New Yorker, there is a piece in it that's quite intelligent and quite disturbing that makes the case that in some ways perhaps Roth approved as a biographer someone who Roth knew was not going to be critical of Roth's relationships with women. I did read that. And um, it's quite intelligent and somewhat disturbing, and uh, one can see certainly a grain of truth, perhaps, in that. So that's where we're at with the Philip Roth biography, and I don't know how, whether someone else will then write a new biography, whether this book will ever be assigned reading in schools or not. Um, I just don't know how it all plays out. So let me ask you, 
the books that are on the bookshelves will remain there, correct? They're not going to be taken off the shelves, or are they? Well, you know, it depends. It is possible that unsold copies, will the publisher will ask them to be returned and pulped and shredded. I mean, it's, it's possible that that's what occurs. You know, there have been situations, for example, when a book was published like someone like J.D. Salinger and they didn't have all the rights that they right. went to court and then the book had to be, you know, removed or where they found out afterwards that there was some something that was made up or fabricated or wrong. So it's possible that Norton uh, will do that. I don't know. I don't know if they have uh, requested that, but it's so certainly possible. Do you think that that is censorship? Because now they're depriving anyone from reading a biography. This is the biography, the only biography of Philip Roth. Well, it's the authorized biography, but my guess is it will not be the only biography and that Roth's estate will give access to whoever wants. I mean, it's not censorship because they are reacting to the... No, I understand. I understand that they're condemning the writer, the author. But I just wonder when it's a nonfiction book of information and they say because the author is egregious in his behavior that now we like um, we erase Philip Roth. Basically. Well, well, I mean, right that's, a separate, that's a separate conversation. And we don't know. We don't know whether another publisher... That's we'll true. pick we'll pick up the book and decide to publish it. We just don't know how it's going to play out, but certainly on a legal or contractual basis, one can certainly make the case that if the publisher knew these facts at the time Bailey was going to start writing the book, they w- might not have given him a contract. Right. I see that. Okay. Well, it's a really so there was in cer- on a certain level a fraud committed against the publisher. I guess so. You know, well, um, this is all other discussion. We could do a whole episode on this. Yes. So, so we'll just move on for now. Yes. I want to tell you that I discovered this website. Um, there's a wonderful, web- first of all, a website that I use all the time that I highly recommend called My Jewish Learning, and that you can look up. Anything about Judaism on my Jewish learning, and I even um, use it when I'm teaching, when I want because it's very simple, it's very accessible, and it gives you the basics. Well, now they've added a new aspect to their website called the Hub, and the Hub is a compilation of all the Jewish learning and culture every day all over the United States, and maybe sometimes in Israel. And it's incredible. It's an, it's overwhelming. I mean, one day is like 35 things. So, you know, but I did pick two to share with, with everyone. One of them, which looked really interesting to me, is a virtual tour of Jewish Vienna with um, all kinds of beautiful photos and a tour guide taking you through Jewish Vienna. And um, the other one is a funny panel called Why Comedians Love Jewish Mothers and More with the comedian Judy Gold and Joyce Antler, who's an author who wrote a book called You Never Call, You Never Write a History of the Jewish Mother. (laughs) And uh, though I, I could talk about how I feel that the Jewish mother has been totally maligned and I don't find Jewish mother jokes funny at all because they're not even true. Maybe they were true 50 years ago, or but they're not true now. But they're still the same jokes. But I think Judy Gold is funny, and I think it'll be a great discussion. And if you find yourself with too many choices, of course, you might need a culture maven to pick among them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Yes. And so I hear you have – what are you watching on Hulu, Tom? I hear you found – Oh, something. well, listen. In 1972 – Aretha Franklin, who was at the top of her career, she had had 11 consecutive hits, Respect, Think, Natural Woman, one after another. What she wanted to do was record a live gospel album to go back to her roots. 
And so um, for two nights, she went to a, a, a church in, in South Central LA with a LA community choir, Warner Brothers, which was uh, recording this album, hired the director, Sidney Pollock, to film it. Wow. There was some technical problem, and so the film was never released once technology had, had improved so that they could fix their problem. For her own reasons, Aretha would not allow this film to be shown. Now, the album, Amazing Grace, that she recorded those two nights became the best-selling album of her career. In 50 years of performing, this was the bestseller, and it remains the best-selling gospel album in history. And Aretha died in 2018. Shortly thereafter, her estate allowed the film to finally be shown, and it is amazing. It is a treat. When someone sings uh, spiritual music, I mean, our cantors, part of it is the conviction you bring to the material. Right. You know, and and Aretha, her voice and what she was singing, the two merged in this way that's incredible to watch. So, And it's called Amazing Grace. The- it's called Amazing Grace, and it's on Hulu. Wow. Well, I can't really compare to that, but <laughs> <laughs> I um, I wanted to recommend a film. It's an English film. It's a wonderful, it's actually a, like a, a limited series called The English Game, and it's beautifully shot, and it's the story of how soccer or football that had only been played by the elite, by the upper class, by, uh, by Eton or by Oxford, you know, and Cambridge. Um a working class team wants to play and wants to challenge. And I bet, I think it's based on a true story. It's about the democratization of soccer slash football in England. So it's got wonderful stories about all these English characters and they're real people. It's a delight. It's interesting. It's beautiful in that English historical way. And it's a great escape and a lot of fun. And then uh, my sister has become obsessed with like Korean soap operas and romantic comedies. And then she um, said, I found an Indian romantic comedy, which I watched and I loved. But what it's about, first of all, it's in English and Hindi because it's upper class um, uh, Indian men. And, you know, the the class is very upper class. So they kind of speak English and Hindi back and forth, in and out. They go in and out of both. But it's about three best friends who go on a trip to Spain for like a bachelor party. It's their bachelor trip. And what happens to them, one of the, uh, one of the guys who's in it, he's the number one heartthrob in India. He's the handsomest guy you've ever seen. He's like the top, you know, like, uh, I don't even know. We don't even have that many handsome guys. But like the Robert Redford, the Cary Grant, that kind of character. He's in it and two others. And it's a it's and there's a little bit of singing because of course it's got a bit of Bollywood. And it's just such a wonderful escape. Like uh, my sister said, try it. I said, all right, I'll turn it on. And I just watched the whole thing immediately. I couldn't stop watching it. So those are two really just escapist movies, which is something we could all use right now. And um, then we're gonna segue to poetry. Uh, recently, I've been reading um, some uh, new poetry, and it's um, lovely. First of all, you know, um, poetry, it's like easy to read one or two before you go to sleep or, you know, after dinner, and and it's sort of a nice thing to do. So I'm going to recommend New and Selected Poems by Kay Ryan, who's an American uh, poet who writes these incredibly clever, uh, good word play poems that I think are very easy to understand. And um, and I also want to recommend the new and collected poems of Wisława Simbroska, who won the Nobel Prize in poetry. Um, and her poems have been translated and they are also very readable, uh, very enjoyable. 
And, you know, I just read a couple uh, a night and um, it, it lifts me up for having done so. Well, I like poetry, so maybe I'll give it a try. But speaking of poetry, I just want I've been getting these am amazing announcements of a new musical that will be online called um, Miriam, the First Woman Prophet. But what makes it special is all the music and lyrics are by Debbie Friedman. May she be remembered for a blessing. And we love Debbie Friedman. Some of them are songs we know, and some of them are brand new songs. It's going to be on May 21st, and I'm definitely going to see that. And I, I knew Debbie personally, and uh, her death was a huge loss for the Jewish world. And finally, I just want to let people know um, that we're going to be having a special kind of Mother's Day program, something very unusual. It's called Journey to Motherhood. And it's with Cantor Lisa Peacott and myself and two amazing other women rabbis. But we're not talking about motherhood. We're talking about infertility, fostering, and adoption, other ways to be a mother. And um, these two other women rabbis are experts in guidance and from a Jewish perspective of fostering and dealing with infertility as you try to get pregnant. So we invite everyone to see that at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th. We invite you all. We say Shabbat Shalom and bye. And we'll Great. see you next time. Take care. Bye. Bye.